Hello and welcome to another Tuesday talk with Ruby Reese. Shortly, I will be joined by Aideen and Adrian from Hounds and Hellies. Um, before they pop on, I want to just let everyone know as well that our previous Tuesday talks are all uploaded onto our website, Ruby dash reese.ie so you can check these all out it's going to kind of turn into hopefully a library of different topics that people um can check out so um in the interest of keeping these talks uh informal and conversational we will be making generalizations that um, might not necessarily reflect your dog you or your situation so if you do have any concerns please do speak to a certified professional um and i'm just going to see to the call Well, there's loads of you joining in this evening. Really interesting topic, man trading. I have loads of questions that I'm really, really looking forward to asking. Um, it's a topic that I must say I probably wouldn't be the, the most knowledgeable about. Um, so I'm really, really looking forward to learning more. Hi, Anne. Good evening. How are you doing? <laughs> Thanks. We were having some technical difficulties, so um, I'm just going to tilt the camera and see is that better or worse. No, that'll drive people nuts. <laughs> this is good. This is good. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining. Um, Adrian and Adrian, would you do us the pleasure of introducing yourselves and saying a few words about uh, your own backgrounds? Um, so, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, so, my own background got, uh, I suppose, the business that Hounds and Helly started about two years ago. I think we're going about two years in September. Um, before that, uh, professionally, I was working with Autism Assistance Dogs Ireland. Um, I looked after their Monster Puppy program for about three or four years. Um, and before that, then I was in, uh, I was doing a full time master's in college for another year as well. And then in a previous life, I worked in pharma, believe it or not. <laughs> so that was right. Yeah. Um, and then in between all that, um, just hobby wise, I was always kind of working dogs. I was heavily involved uh, and still am in, in search and rescue dogs, um, training my own dogs for various sports, including, you know, God, uh, working trial obedience. Um, obviously the man trail and stuff like that and yeah it kind of all came together then when uh, after I uh, after I ended up slipping a disc in my back when I was working with Autism Assistance Dogs Ireland and couldn't do the driving anymore covering Munster okay. so that's kind of what led me into Hounds and Hellies then and uh, pretty much myself and Adrian had a bit of a chat and we're kind of saying will we will we give it a go and we did that was pretty much it from my side anyway. Yeah, um, myself, I'm Adrian O'Hara, so um, I, my background uh, is I, I work in, in rescue helicopters, I've been doing that since 1998. Uh, I don't work a dog, I actually, you know, up until recently didn't even have a, a pet dog, but uh, love dogs, so, uh, and that's my interest in it there, then, if you like, at that stage. My side of the business, if you like, is the, the leads and collars, uh, and making all the waterproof gear and stuff like that, so with our combined experience, of search and rescue, it gave us a, a taste of what we actually wanted from an equipment point of view, but that we could never actually really find in the shops. So that kind of drove us then to, to start making our own kit for exactly what we wanted and obviously for what other people wanted as well. So we custom make everything down here in the workshop in where we're actually sitting here at the moment. Uh, we custom make it down in, in Lismore and County Watford. Brilliant. Thank Thank you very much for the introductions. I've got, uh, you're already giving me more and more questions. Ideas are <laughs> blazing in my brain. But just in case anyone's watching in that doesn't know me as well, I'm Killian O'Keefe from uh, Ruby Reese. We just set up our company uh, just over 12 months ago. We're based in Cork and uh, we set it up because our own dog, Ruby, has lots of sensitivity, sensitive tummy, sensitive skin. So we created products, for example, like our pH balanced uh, dog shampoo um, that is suitable even for dogs with very, very sensitive skin. So let's launch into the topic about man trailing. The, the, the obvious question, the elephant in the room is, what is man trailing? Well, man trailing 
billing is one of those sports that seems to be taken uh, taken the, the country by storm at the moment. So it's really difficult to kind of keep up with the demand that we have. So where it has its origins is very much in kind of search and rescue and almost military background. So, you know, like those American movies where you'll see like the bloodhound being handed like a T-shirt belonging to the person that they're looking for, or like an escaped prisoner or something. Uh, and then literally puts the nose down and starts following the route that person took until it finds them at the end. Um, so in its origin, the search and rescue, it's a it's a very powerful tool. Um, but what we do here is we use it for pet dog training. Um, so what people generally do with, with man trailing is you need certain pieces of equipment, your long line, your treats, things like that. Um, and we teach pet dog owners how to teach the dog to do this fantastic, amazing skill. And they learn to do it in all types of terrain, in all types of environment. You can do it uh, in the woods. You can do it in the city center. You can even do it indoors. You can do it anywhere. Okay. And I suppose you've, you've mentioned that um, the sense of smell is is kind of is is what we're going with so it's for it's for pets that you do but it's it's all following a scent so are there breeds that uh, that are do you notice a big difference between breeds whether they're they have a very heightened sense of smell and some are, are worse or um are all breeds relatively good sniffers well, I think compared to a human nose, every breed is like uh, light years ahead of what a human is capable of smelling. So I think, God, you hear you hear different analogies, um, you know, bandied around. The one that always stuck with me is like, uh, you know, where we'd smell a, a spritz of perfume in a room, uh, a dog could detect it in an entire football stadium. Um, okay. How sensitive their nose is. Um, you don't have any breed in particular that takes to it more than others. Um, maybe your little brachiophallic breeds like Ruby say we'd have to be careful about man trailing her like in the heat in summer months just because they can overheat a little bit more, which she's every bit as capable of doing it as a Belgian Malinois and stuff like that. Um, breeds that are a little bit more challenging sometimes to get to do man trailing are the sight hounds. It's not impossible at all. We have a lot of sight hounds that do trail with us. But you're very much, you know, their first instinct is instinct is to use their eyes to try to find some to find what they're looking for. Um, so we really need to convince them over a few sessions that we want them to use their nose. Yeah. Okay, okay. And I um then so so breeds, you're saying pretty much most of them can give it a go, but are there are there other types of dogs or how do reactive dogs or nervous dogs do with with something like this? Yeah, so reactive dogs um, and nervous dogs are pretty much, I think when I started this, it was definitely like the majority of all the courses that we had on. Um, it was, I think, like um, uh, Catherine from Sound and About was recommended to her reactive clients and or reactive dog clients. So I think like the first three or four courses that I put on were completely uh, owners of reactive dogs. So uh, like what we do with the, with the reactive dogs is uh, we're not any more or less careful with them in that everybody in their intro workshop um, people will see when they book in some environments we say like because uh, we're saying we're going to start to do uh, intro workshops in the marina market now soon now that obviously wouldn't be suitable for a reactive dog to do its first trailing because there's no way you can you know control the situation there but every other venue that I use we're well able to um, like some of the venues are private some of the venues are in very remote areas and other venues then are just in quiet areas where I have full permission to use it even though it's not 100% private uh, we have permission to use it so what what we do is we just create a repeatable, consistent reward mechanism for them, um, for the reactive dogs. We do it for all dogs, but reactive dogs, once they know exactly what they're expected to do, and as long as they're rewarded in the same way every time, um, they become very resilient to what happens with them in the environment. And when they're using their nose as well, when they're doing any type of scent work, but man training is, is just one of those things that you know that the owners adore because they're out with other people and uh, when they're using their nose their brain is has less has less space to get reactive about stuff because it's very much focused on a task and a task that's innate within the dog so dogs are hunters and with man trailing we're just teaching them to hunt people um that's all it is so we have dogs who are resource gardeners who are aggressive towards people who are reactive or aggressive to other, other dogs um and they've done so 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 well like we just never put them in a situation that we know is too much for them so we just change things around incrementally so they're always able to cope with it 
Um, and it's my job to make sure I never put that dog or that owner in a situation that we know that they can't handle. I suppose like like any sort of training, a lot of it's to do with building confidence and, sh- you know, kind of putting them on the right path, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Because like, to be honest, the, the, the biggest job at the start with a reactive dog owner is to get them to give that dog some of the long line. <laughs> so they're coming with like long lines that are seven meters. Mm-hmm. But the thought of having that dog more than two meters away from them is just like, because they've had so many bad experiences that they're like, oh, it's almost like they just, they have a death grip on that lead. Um, But it's fantastic when you see how over the space of a few sessions, how they learn to trust their dog, how they learn to read their dog, how much they see their dog has taken to this. Um, And they're able to, to just, it's not that their dog is cured from being reactive, but over time, what we can do is put in the triggers that would normally set them off, but put them in at a, a very safe distance and start building them in slowly but surely. So we have dogs um, like I know, say Molly Moo, she's uh, she's one of our, I think, very first um, uh, reactive dogs that I had in one of my very first workshops. Um, and even the, the owner, Misha, when she arrived, she was so nervous, she was so tense. Um, she didn't, we were in the park, she didn't want to trail there or anything. And, you know, she was willing to give it a go, but I could tell she's really reactive. She's now at the stage where the dog who was dog reactive and people reactive will check strangers out on a trail to see, is it you that I'm looking for? Is it you that I'm looking for? No, no, no. We'll pass dogs and pretty much see a dog coming ahead of her and go, no, no, I'm, I've got a job to do and it'll take its turn. Um, and Misha's just absolutely so proud of her. Like, it's it's wonderful to see. Like, Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're giving giving them a job to do is is definitely you know they've got a goal already in mind, like you say, so yeah. they're they're not concentrating on on other things. Brilliant. And so, what would you say is is the big difference between um, you know training a pet dog for man trailing, um, you know, for for sport as opposed to man trailing for search and rescue? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of differences, but I suppose the main ones, and, and Adrian might jump in for some of them here, but say from my side of things as an instructor, so I'm trained through Man Training Global, um, and they have uh, devised a method of training pet dogs who've never man trailed before. So introducing them to it and taking them through their set, through, through their progression sessions, where regardless of whether that dog is shy, reactive, timid, uh, like a complete absolute overexcited loon whatever it might be that you still get the dog to do it you might need to draw the motivation out of the dog because they might be very lax just the owner wants them to, to do it the dog might be very low in motivation um, so the man training global method is there and it's designed it's been adapted from a search and rescue method but it's been adapted specifically for pet dogs Whereas if you're training a a working line dog that has turned up for search and rescue training, um, well, then that dog is pre-programmed to want to work. I don't need to pull it out of that dog to want to actually work. That dog is turning up just raring to go. So the 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 the, the, so starter ingredients that you're you're starting with, that little thing that you have to mold, it's a completely different animal, you know, that way then um now you have a lot of pets that are working line and stuff like that, but a lot of the time as well, because a, a very sometimes a, a working line dog and a pet a pet dog home might develop some issues. Um, such as like collies, they might have started to try to nip the kids or herd chase mm-hmm. cars and all this kind of stuff. Um, you can't have that collie then doing urban man trailing for search and rescue if it chases cars and nips people. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. um, things like that make an issue. Um, the other thing would be like your main thing is your your pet dog can make mistakes on a trail. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Whereas your search and rescue dog is once they reach a certain level, like lives depend on it, they have mm-hmm. to be bomb proof. Um, and then the big thing is pretty much the difference in the other end of the leaves, so it's the handler. So, and, and that's probably the, the biggest change then as well, because the, the handler, like as Aideen was saying, for the man trail and for the sports side of it, it's very much a fun event. We do obviously put in their own little challenges and stuff in like that as well, but it's really the dog is being challenged and the owner has to be able to read the dog to know that they're working through the challenges. Whereas in an actual live operation or live search, there's so much more um, expected of the handler then also. Because uh, a, when you come back for a search area, you, you may have to work out your own search area yourself as in the dangers, where you want to go, how you want to approach it. And that's all left down to you. There will be nobody there guiding you. You're, you could be the only, the first of the emergency services to turn up on the scene. So you're pretty much running the show, at least your own search area, until other people turn up. And then when you come back, when you finish the search, then you may have to hand over or give a report to Gardaí or maybe some emotional members of a family 
or other members of our emergency services. So the, the, the pressure and I suppose the ante is up an awful lot then at that stage then as well. So obviously, as Aideen says, like there's, there's so much more on the line and there's no there's no fun aspect to it. it it's it's a practical, it's it's a it's it's a function that has to be done. Uh, yeah. and it has to, it has to be carried out very detailed and very meticulously then as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I suppose for, for the dog community that, that we see on, on Instagram quite a lot, we we don't always know the the, the lengths and breadths of, of how dogs are used in Ireland. So is are dogs commonly used in Ireland as, as working dogs in this sense for man trailing? Is, uh, what does that look like? Because I'm sure the average person like me, a Frenchie owner, doesn't necessarily know what's what's going on out there in the in the world apart from, from our own back garden, you know? Yeah, like as as regards, like, say, there's a couple of different, uh, I suppose, disciplines that you can use in operation work to train a dog to find a person. Um, the majority of dogs that are used are kind of like your air scent dogs. So maybe anybody who would have attended any of our um, search and rescue seminars or maybe some of our like public events like Pups the Park and stuff like that, you might have seen the, the air scent and dogs work. So they work off the lead and they're trained to find any person. Um, so they won't be scent specific, uh, like a man training dog. They'll find if you send them off into the woods and they come across another searcher, they'll let me know that they found them. So the dog comes back and lets me know, barks at me and then brings me into the into the person that they found. So on an operational search, if you do find the missing person, if they are in your area, you could find four other people before that. Um, and that air scent dog is I suppose, your typical mountain rescue dog because you're working in remote areas. The likelihood of you coming across other people, it's possible, but it's not likely. Um, whereas in an urban area, it just wouldn't be possible to the dog couldn't go through the without meeting somebody and having to indicate that they found someone. Um, they're the most popular type of search and rescue dog in Ireland. Um, but there's been a shift now from, I suppose, the needs of, of someone who's, uh, or like search and rescue teams. Um, and your lowland search and rescue teams are definitely more in need of man trailing dogs because they're, you know, they're in more kind of, they're, your lowland areas are, are not really in the mountain basically because they're lowland areas but they're you're looking for a specific person so maybe somebody has gotten lost on a walk and their car is still in the car park of the woods. Um, yeah you can send an air scent dog in but you don't know where that person has gone so you're kind of throwing throwing uh, darts at a map and saying we're going to check around here whereas your trailing dog will start the car and follow the route that person took until they find them. Um, and it'll do that in the middle of a city centre. It'll do that in the middle of town. It'll do it anywhere. So you can use your trailing dog anywhere. And I think just in general, with I suppose the the change of landscape, sometimes of over search and rescue, with tech, uh, a lot more people in remote areas, um, they're able like coverage is better. They're able to phone for help. You know, uh, it, it's they people carry GPS. So if they are missing or lost or just can't make it back, they can tell people quite easily where they are because they carry a GPS or their Google Maps will tell them or what three words is available. Whereas if you somebody who maybe doesn't want to be found or you have somebody who might be like an elderly person who's wandered off, um, the, the tech's not going to help there. So that's kind of where your man trail and dog is, is going to be at its strongest. Yeah. Yeah. And going back to, so so that's the professional side and then going back to the, the pet side and doing this more for fun, I suppose. Um, is is man training something that you see that the the handlers enjoy? Um, and is this something that then on the on the flip side that, that pet dogs tend to enjoy? I think a lot of the gang who man trail refer to themselves as the addicts. Like it's just, it's, I see more of my clients at the moment than I see of my own family, I'd say, because they're just... Uh, like we train um, uh, about three evenings a week we're training and then we do some training sometimes at the weekends um, so like I see people at least there's some clients I see once a week there's some clients I see twice a week there's some kinds of clients I see like 10 times a month at different training sessions um, so people love it it's outdoorsy and I definitely think since COVID and stuff People are a lot more, you know, used to going outside into nature and um, doesn't matter if it's like town on a a Tuesday night um, or whether it's the woods. People like to be outdoors now and want to be outdoors. Um, And then I just think when when a dog gets to do what a dog is built for, which is to hunt and then gets rewarded for it, you see such... uh, uh, you just see such uh, what's a joy pretty much like on the dog that like 
people tell us like their dog starts driving up to the training areas or they start driving the dog up to the training areas and the dog starts like once they make the turn that's up towards where we, we, where we may train regularly on one of the nights uh, the dog starts yipping in the back it's so excited to go like even then picking up the harness at home or picking up the long line uh, the dog is instantly like running for the car so like you know the dogs love it the people love it and it's it's very social isn't it it's, it's brilliant yeah it's fantastic and, and it's amazing as you see the dogs progress through the not the challenges but the different trails and as the trails get lengthier and we start putting in more you know junctions or distractions or whatever the case is when when both get to the to the missing person at the end of the trail it's amazing to see the expression on on the owner's face because they say oh, I actually didn't think he was going to make it through the junction or I didn't think or whatever the case was so they're actually delighted and you can see the confidence building in their own dog that they were actually able to figure it out themselves because like at the end of the day a dog is a sentient being so like they're, they're going to learn from stuff and I think it's it's very rewarding then to see people watching their dog learn and watching their dog advance and but also it brings on the owner then as well leaps and bounds like you know so it's fantastic yeah so the, the, to go back to the original questions the, the owners absolutely love it probably as much as the dogs if not more it's like <laughs> Very good. And and what can what can someone expect? So someone, you know, like me, never done man trailing before. I'm bringing Ruby along to say a first session or workshop. Uh, what what's to expect from the very very beginning? All right. So your introduction workshop is how everyone starts. So um, once you're at your intro workshop, and I can even chat about how people book there in a minute. But once you're at your intro workshop, there's some equipment that I ask to, you to bring with you. Um, generally, I have long lines if people don't have one already. Uh, we do ask people to bring their own harness for their dog because uh, obviously you could have a Frenchie and you could have a Birdies and I'm not going to have a harness that fits every dog. So we ask people to bring a, a harness with the dog uh, and to bring rewards for the dog. Because again, that's important. You could have a dog with some allergies like uh, like Ruby. Um, so it's important that we bring rewards that the dog can have and it's not going to make uh, life worse for the owner when they get home that night. Um, so basically what you can expect is a taster, like an introduction to man trailing. So it's such a broad, massive, in-depth topic that our three hour workshops aren't going to cover everything. But we want to give you just enough for you to go, Do you know what, I really think I might enjoy this. Um, and just enough that you know whether you want to commit to buying the equipment that you might need or just, you know, committing to turn up to training every couple of weeks or something like that. Um, so generally what we do is we kind of break it down into little steps. So we do, everybody does three trails, but uh, after each trail, we look for certain feedback. So we don't get you to do a trail and then criticize everything you did along the way. <laughs> All we do is uh, we do one trail. We kind of demo. Usually I'd have one of my dogs with me. Um, I'll show you how we set it up. We'll do a demo with my dog. And then you guys will all do that first trail as well. Um, after the first trail, we do a bit of group feedback. I talk about if something went, you know, a little off or if the dog acted in a certain way, why that happens. Because it's important to understand the why, not just do what you're told sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then everybody goes into the second trail looking to work on what we did in our first trail. Everybody's a lot more confident on their second trail because, do you know, the way turning up full of a, a group of people that you don't know, uh, suddenly a harness becomes like this puzzle that you just can't solve when there's five or six people standing around looking at you put it yeah. on so by the time you get to your second trail people are a lot more relaxed um and the dog is kind of starting to recognize oh this is this is something this is I, I kind of get what's going on here you see almost like a little light start to flick in the back of the dog's mind um and by the third trail we're looking that we know exactly I suppose what motivates your dog is in the midst for what we call firing up the dog, what kind of a motivation, that motivator that your dog likes. Um, you should know a little bit about line handling, enough to go home and practice because the line handling is probably the, the toughest part when you start out. Um, and I want to know basically how your dog is interacting with strangers. Um, and then I can advise you on, on what we ask people to do when your dog is at that point where they found them and you're rewarding them. Because some dogs, when they find a stranger hiding behind a bush, think it's like the weirdest thing they've ever seen and get an awful fright. Uh, and if that person jumps out going, well, you're such a good dog, that dog's going to run the opposite way. So we try to keep it as relaxed as possible and, you know, just to 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 make sure that the dog, even though we think they should love someone leaping out from behind a bush to reward them, that they're perfectly happy in that situation. So by the time you're finished your workshop, um, what you should be going is, do you know what, I think, I think I'd really like this or else you might turn around and go, do you know what? I'm glad I did the workshop. I heard so much about man trailing, but you know what? I just don't think this is the sport for me. So that's kind of it by the end of the intro workshop. 
And then with myself, what people generally do afterwards or what we do afterwards, everything after that then is pay as you go. So we do like uh, sessions three evenings a week and then weekends. Um, and they're just literally, you book them online. We have a little booking app and you just pay, you know, book in advance, pay for the ones that you want to do. But there's no like long term commitment to booking like six weeks or anything. Um, people just book the, the classes that they want when they want to do them. Very good. And I know that uh, if, if a stranger jumped out uh, from behind a tree at Ruby, she'd, uh, she'd just be begging for cuddles and uh, <laughs> absolutely love it. So so maybe there is a very good case for, for Frenchies and the, the more, you know, standard, typical household pets, as opposed to, to the ones you might associate with professional search. Um, and and where do you where do you offer workshops? So is, is there a specific location or do you travel around the country? Where Where is your, you know, the places that, that we can find you and uh, um, yeah is there specific locations that you go to? No we try to keep it as flexible as possible so we do um, in Waterford we work in Dungarvan so we do intro workshops there and what we call our progress sessions which are the pay as you go sessions in Cork we do them in Fermoy and Middleton and um, we've ones in July starting at the Marina Market um, I do them down in Killarney and Kerry um, and I do some in Galway as well. Um, now, because we're so busy in the last couple of months, we took on um, a second instructor. Um, her name is Maeve from Irish Guide Dogs. And uh, so she's helping out now doing, I suppose, the extra sessions because the demand is there. But she'll soon be running um, the introduction workshops and the progress sessions more around kind of Cork City um, and the suburbs around there. Um, just so because there are people who are traveling like of people who travel like God from in Shannon to Middleton on a Tuesday night at half seven after work. And they turn up every Tuesday. Whereas if you could offer them something closer to Cork City, it's less of a, a commute and stuff for them. So people are really willing to travel. So I'm looking to, um, thankfully with Maeve on board, that people won't have to travel as far, but still get like a really good training session and stuff in. Um, we also offer, uh, like I'm, I'm really committed to, um, I suppose, people getting a wide variety of man training experiences. So throughout the year, I, we run... Um, different types of uh, seminars, search and rescue seminars or workshops and stuff. So like say at the end of this month, we have Monica Diaz. She's coming over from Spain. She's an operational dog handler over there. And like myself, then she trains it also for pet dog owners. So she's coming over to do a three day advanced man trailing seminar with us in Fermoy. So that's sold out there. God, I'd say it's the start of the year. Uh, we do still have some spectator spots left if anybody wants them. Um, and in September as well, the, the offers just went out to applicants today, but we have Kevin Pertle, who's over in Texas. I was over with him there, uh, I'd say it was about a month ago. Um, so he's coming to do two two-day seminars in Dungarvan. Um, so one of the two days, or sorry, the 8th and 9th, it would be kind of a sports day, which is the pet dog owner side of things. And then the 10th and 11th is kind of a SAR dedicated one, which is people who are already in a search team or have recently joined one or interested in joining a search team and they want to start progressing themselves on um so we'll have more of those then going next year and you, so you've mentioned a couple of times you know the the growing popularity in Ireland um but you've also mentioned people coming in from abroad so from Spain and from from the states is is man trailing something that's kind of up and coming in Ireland but is very established in other countries as as a sport um as opposed obviously we know it's it's it exists in a professional context but as a sport is it um is it more established elsewhere and, and we're kind of catching up or is Ireland kind of flying the flag there or what's what's the situation yeah we're, we're definitely catching up as regards you know man trailing for for sport um the like god there's there's organizations that international ones I know like there's uh, the international rescue organization it's actually search dogs is a sport with them um and like pet dog owners can enter like international competitions doing different types of search dog sports um everything from the air ascent to the man trailing to collapse structure stuff um so you know there's there is the operational side of things and then there's this amazing thing that you can do as a sport where you can train your dog up to a very high level of course there's a huge amount more attached to it if you wanted to do it operationally you'd have to be part of the team but there is the actual training it as a sport love because it's kind of it's just so different to any other dog sport out there um and yeah so Ireland is very much catching up but I think it's obvious from us was the demand out there at the moment that people want it and people are so keen to get involved yeah yeah and um so 
lots of people want to get involved, but are there are there any you know frequent misconceptions that you see from people? You know, for I can imagine um, one thing that jumps to mind is will my dog now be going off? Um, you know, on a trail every time we go out. Uh, you know, are there misconceptions to do with man trailing uh, that that you'd like to nip in the bud here and now? Yeah, there's John, there's a little few. So one, a lot of people say, oh, but you know, he's not. He doesn't really have any good obedience, um, and I'm like doesn't actually have to be. <laughs> the more the more he's willing to just ignore you and put his nose down uh the better it is at the very beginning of the man trailing journey um but uh i do get that question a lot oh is he going to be pulling me on the lead now all the time or something like that and the answer is no because um we set up uh, a trail in a very specific way once you're into it uh in the sport week you have specific equipment and gear so your dog wears his man trailing harness only wears it for man trailing he only wears his specific long line for man trailing as well and when he's not wearing those, he learns that often wearing just my regular harness. Well, then I just do what I regularly do, which is hopefully a, a loose lead walk or something like that. Um, so the dogs learn really quickly how how to how to behave in a specific context. And lots of owners have found that um, because they have this outlet of using their nose, that actually uh, when they're not man trailing, they're a far more relaxed creature to live with and to to I suppose go walking with and stuff like that because. They, they have that outlet in that time when they can use their nose and do what they want to do. And then the other time, they're just that little bit kind of like more relaxed. Very good. Well, I, I'm definitely ready to sign Ruby off. Um, <laughs> was, uh, do you have, do you have any, um, I, I know, I, I know you're busy this evening and everything, so I don't want to keep you too long, but you know, do you have any closing thoughts or tips to give to people that might be thinking about about man trailing? Uh, is there anything that people need to know uh, before they sign up? And uh... um, do you know what? There is, I suppose that yeah, yeah. it's open to everybody, yeah. um, and we mean absolutely everybody. So regardless and whatever type of dog that you have at the very least get in touch with us and maybe especially people with first time dog owners you know because it's it's a focus for the dog and not only will you obviously learn uh, a new I would say a new sport for the dog but you also learn an awful lot from other people that are on the group then as well because it obviously attracts an awful lot of like-minded people and it's amazing that when people actually start turning up to the groups and stuff that they find that it like up oh, and you know I'm having such such a problem with this dog. You hear somebody else in the group saying, "Yeah, yeah, I'm the same," and this is how I got over it. So it's it's a very it's a very easy going group. Uh, it's like you said earlier on. What what should you expect when you come to the group? Expect to have a bit of crack, and and expect your dog to fight right then as well because it's, it's it just really is a nice way to spend an afternoon. To be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, I think that that would be attractive to a lot of people. Actually, the the idea of the community and achieving something together, moving towards a goal together that's uh, that's something I suppose an awful lot of us missed during COVID, and the, that we have a chance to do it outdoors now as well. It's uh, it's brilliant. Yeah, very good. Thank you so so much for joining me uh, for a Tuesday talk. Really, really appreciate it. Um, for. Those of you watching in, please go and uh, check out Hounds and Hallies on Instagram. And if you're not following us, you can give us a follow as well at Ruby Reese Official. Um, yeah, huge thank you to both of you for joining us. No problem. Thanks, Cheers. Thank you. Thanks, William.